Welcome back to another episode of the Four Insight Podcast, episode 26. I'm your host, Mike Obi. Got a crazy episode for y'all this week, man. This is going to be a banger, but I'm ready. Uh, joining me today is one of my old teammates. This is going to be a trenches edition. You know, I played D-line with this guy. And without further ado, my guy, Torian Williams. Torian, welcome to the show, man. Hey, glad to be here, man. You know what I'm saying? Blessed. Obi, I missed you, man. It's been a minute, dog. For sure, man. For sure, man. How you doing? Yes, sir. How are you? Oh, man. Truly blessed, like I said, man. For sure. Definitely. Let's get into, um, you know, present day, man. Uh, last time I spoke to you was before this whole COVID shutdown and everything. Uh, you told me you had gotten a job. So just what's going on with you uh, right now? So pretty much I'm just uh, doing IT with the construction aggregates company, mm -hmm. uh, man. Uh, so coming out of the gates, out of college, I got lucky, bro. I found a job at a, uh, what do they call those? A job fair. And uh, me and the guy, we hit it, we hit it off, man. You know, I'm a people person. So he had got the opportunity to speak with me in person. And that was kind of like my interview on the spot right there. So mm -hmm. I got lucky there. Yeah, definitely. It's all about fortunes, you know, in 2020. Uh, for me, you know, when I spoke to you, I was still in between. I was still uh, working part time at two jobs and, uh, you know, COVID shut everything down. So we were quarantining and, uh, you know, I was looking and I was just applying for grad school and everything. And I was coming up short, you know, in the beginning. But then I just, you know, I start this podcast up and I'm still looking. And then all of a sudden, uh, there's some positions opening up for contact tracing and I'm like, okay, well, I did public health. This is my background. And nice. I go up to the, uh, Harris County and you know, the rest is history. They hit me up yeah. the week and I get a job. So man, yeah, exactly. Fortune hey. on my end as well. Yes, sir. Hey, now it's a climb to the top. Now it's a climb to the top. You know what I'm saying? Put us together. But, you know, where I want to start off is like I do with every episode, man. You know, your football story especially is one I think all the listeners can really benefit from just hearing you, hearing your mindset and, you know, just you speak on it. Um, where I want to begin is I had Cam Townsend on the show a couple weeks back. And he told me about how when you guys were small, you know, you got him into football. So just for you, what got you into playing the game? Uh, I definitely say um, a combination of having, you know, older brothers picking on you, beating you up and uh, <laughs> my dad as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, the usual start, you know, <laughs> the bully. The bully gets you started and then you, you get into football and you get to release some of that anger on the field, man. And, you know, the rest is history after that. So, yeah, what about yourself? You. Um, he is same thing. I had one older brother who was seven years older than I was and always, you know, bigger than me and wrestling all the time and, you yeah. know, picking on me. And it's all fun and games, man. You know, it's nothing like anything negative. But, you no, know, I was just like my brother started playing ball. So, you know, me being the little bro is like, well, I'm going to play ball and I'm going to be better than yeah. him. You know, there that it is. Thing. And, you know, my dad being tough on us, pushing us hard, you know, he needed uh a uh, way to, you know, outlet some frustration, some anger, and so football is a natural way. Also, uh, being bullied in school, too, you know, being a heavy set kid, you know, they tell you you can't fight in school, so you need to, you need to let out some of that anger. So, okay, uh, a sport where I'm allowed to hit you, sure enough, and the rest was history, as you say. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, you play and, uh, you know, we get to RP together. Um, and in the beginning, you know, things are going pretty good for you. Uh, you get moved up to the JV team, which that was our highest level when we were freshmen. Um, and then, you know, your sophomore year, you know, we're in the same grade. So our sophomore year hits and uh, you kind of hit a bit of a adversity from the standpoint. You don't really have a defined position. They don't really know what to do with you. So just talk about what that was like our second year and that first year being on varsity and what was going through your head. I will say, man, it is funny that you remember that because not a lot of people remember. <clears throat> not a lot of people remember that, um, you know, I, I really couldn't decide what I wanted to do when it came to football. Um, I remember at one point I was like, man, I want to leave Ridgepoint. Like, 
they're not letting me play what I want to play. I want to play defense. I'm getting in Coach Fisher's ear, the old line coach. I'm getting his ear. I'm like, man, I want to play defense, man. I don't want to play offense. Um, and Coach Cobo, I'm telling him every day as I pass him the hallway, Coach, I want to play defense. I'm a, I'm a defensive guy. And, he, you know, he's just laughing it, laughing it off. And he was like, you know what? You know, let, let, let's give this guy a tryout. Like, you know, like, why not? You know, so Coach Coach Cobo went to talk to Coach Niffin. And Coach Fisher was cool with it because I was a backup. So one practice we was doing, uh, I don't know if you remember this, we was doing Bull in the Ring. And they had me go against Danny Woodard. I don't know if you remember my guy, Danny Woodard. Oh, I remember. That is my boy, man, for sure. (laughs) Danny Woodard, man, heavier set guy. And, you know, I definitely got some push off the ball, you know, definitely let him know that I wasn't scared and I was able to use my hand. So, Right there, it took off. Yes, sir. Man, and I remember, you know, just that first play you got put in the game, it, to me it was just a matter of a guy who just needed his opportunity. That was it. it and, uh, you know, it, it's crazy because this is a story and a scenario that really fits a lot of young athletes. You know, the tweener who doesn't have a position yeah. defined yet and he's just waiting for an opportunity. He's trying to, you know, buy in and just, you know, be a – be a good company guy, and then all of a sudden, you know, somebody either gets hurt or, you know, they need help somewhere else, and then boom, you know, you seize it. Um, there it is. But talk about, you know, were you kind of, you know, you talked about how you had thought about leaving RP, and then there's this mm-hmm. whole, you know, player putting in the coach's ear, you know, about I want to, I don't want to play offense, I want to play defense. That didn't concern you at all, you know, for it. It definitely did, but I'll say what helped the most was uh, when Gary, Gary uh, Manuel, whenever he went down, you know, whenever he he was hurting, um, I, f- I can't remember exactly what was going on. It was something with his heart, though. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of, you know, helped my sin- his situation. You know, I kind of benefited from it just because the coach was like, well, that's our best DN, you know, what should we do? And they were like kind of trying some guys out, and I'm like, you're looking at him right here, like coach. Like <laughs> I'm right here. Like don't go nowhere. You don't got to go recruit nobody. Look, I'm right here. Just give me a shot, you know. So if you a young player out there, young talent, and you just like you said, if you that backup guy, you're not sure what you want to do. Hey man, talk to your coaches. Stay in their ear, but at the same time, you know, be a sport of the game and you know keep playing. You know, I still had to I had a job O line. That was my first job. Still had to play O line, be that backup, be that guy. But man, when that when that time was called, you know, my time was called. You gotta take off. No, sure. and that's a and that's a great point too that you bring up. That listen, we're not saying on this uh, on this podcast here, like yo, go and cuss out the coach or say that you're not gonna play mm-hmm. unless you're giving that. Don't do that. That's that's no. actually the opposite of what you should do. And I had to tell players that before, like, nah, man. Just keep doing your job, and if they need you or if the opportunity presents itself, then you seize it. Because what you don't want to do is make yourself come off as the guy who's now a, a nuisance or who's going to cause trouble because, you know, that that's a very, very fine line and a very slippery slope that you don't want to get yourself into. So don't get your trouble in, don't get yourself in trouble by being like, oh, I'm not going to play defense or I'm not going to play offense or I'm not going to play a certain position. But, let you know, if there's help needed, say, hey. I'll step up to the plate if that's what y'all need me to do. And Come on just seize every opportunity that you're given. It was the same thing for me. Uh, I was a tweener. They didn't know whether they wanted to play me at end or nose. Or I was about to mention. Line. And all of a sudden, you know, Coach Kobe just comes up to me and is like, hey, Mike, we need some help at nose. Would you play it? I'm like, shoot, I really don't play nose. But if that's what's going to get me on the field, then sure, you know, and the rest was history. And I had to change – you know, diet had to change training, had to change the way I played the game. But, you know, if it got me on the field, that was all I cared about. And I definitely feel like that that season that we had, man, it was like it was like all or nothing, bro. Like we we putting it all out here on the on the field. I know you wanted to win state just as bad as Kaiser, just as right. bad as J Jack, Steve Ann. You know, I could go on for days, but, sure, you man. know. 
we wanted it bad enough. I know it gave me hype right now. It won't right. get me out my chair just thinking about it. <laughs> for real, though, no, it's crazy, bro. They don't know. They don't know the story, man. Man, for real. But just sticking to the timeline, though. So, uh, you know, our sophomore season ends. You uh, were started to end the season. You go from a guy who's, like you said, a backup. You get your opportunity. You make the most of it. You start in a playoff game. Then that season ends, and that off season, you know, I noticed something in you where. I think this is really key and really vital when it comes to training your body. You were in the weight room every single day I can remember and just relentlessly worked at the game. And you fast forward to your junior year, you become an all state, not all district, an all state defensive end. So just talk about what that process was like for you. Um, I definitely will say it was a, a tough process just adjusting um, and understanding that I was one of the smaller guys coming out my sophomore year and just, you know, seeing the talent that I was facing that last playoff game, you know, getting pushed around a little bit, you know, getting hit pretty hard. And then, you know, the coach is telling me, OK, it's time you need to put on some weight. We're going to let you play the position. What you going to do with it? So that was a, a huge challenge and man, just taking advantage of the opportunity. That was, that was really all it was. My mom in my ear every day, like, look, they gonna let you play. If you want to stay at Ridge point, right. Ball out, you know, get ready. You know? And so then talk about, you know, your approach to training your body and weightlifting, you know, you know, for the listeners out there who, they're just playing in a program, but they don't really know how to train their body. They don't know how to approach the off season, you know, because for you, you had a plan. And I think that's something that a lot of men and women are missing. They don't have a plan. They just are being told to do things or they just, right on. you know, they just say, OK, I'm supposed to work out, but they don't really know how to approach it. So just go into what your training process was in the off season, especially that particular one where you're trying to transform your body. I will say starting off, um, just understanding that. I was going to need to sacrifice that time to get bigger. You got to tell yourself, if you really want to do this, you really want to get to the next level. Just, just know it's, it's going to be tough. You're going to lose time with your girl. You ain't going to be able to go, you know, do this and this and that, but find, <laughs> find you a good group of friends that, that really want to get to that next level. And I feel like that's what really helped me. If I really want to be honest, having um, Tyler Turner in my ear, Bro, yeah. uh, you know, like, yeah. hey, bro, where that muscle at? You know, you strong or, you know, having Steve Ann, having you, you know, like on the on the weight boards, you know, just trying to keep up with everybody, man. We had a awesome group to just try to keep up with and be better than challenge yourself. Find that group and then excel. Be better than the group. You know? No, for sure, man. I think that was, you know, I keep talking about our team and our defense specifically, but it's really just to embody what it takes to really become exceptional because we had a collective of guys. It wasn't just one or two because if you have only pockets of people, I mean, it just isn't going to work. It takes a group effort and a collective um, buy-in. And like you said, having Tyler Turner, having Steve Van, for me, having you on the D-line with me, knowing that, Man, Torian's counting on me to hold the middle down for him. Kyler's counting on me to hold the middle down for him. Steve Ann's counting on me to make sure I don't get blocked into him as well as Dan. And, you know, coaches buying into you and trusting you. And so definitely surrounding yourself with the right influences, with the people who are on the same trajectory as you is very important and very vital. And, uh, yeah, a big thing you pointed out, which is key and probably one of the biggest lessons and the biggest things I try to tell people is, your priorities, you're going to have to re reevaluate them, yeah. you know, is hanging out with your girlfriend, boyfriend, whomever, is that more important than, you know, bettering yourself, right? Or, you know, are you going to take your grades seriously to make sure that you can even get on the field? That's the most important thing. You know, I think that's the biggest thing that gets athletes, you know, in trouble is not even their talent and ability, but you can't even get on the field. If a college looks at you, and says, um, Torian's grades aren't that good. I don't know. You're already putting yourself behind the eight ball. But, um, yeah, definitely it was it was crazy to just to see how much, you know, work you put in. And it was very admirable. That's why whenever you had success, it was like, yeah, do puts in the work. Um, but you talked about having to build your body up and at gain weight. So how much were you when you started off season sophomore year? And how much did you get to when we were juniors? How many pounds did you have to gain? Um, so 
sophomore year to junior year sophomore year i finished up i was about 223 around there and by the time i got to my junior year i was about like 232 mm -hmm. of good like muscle like i grew a little bit uh man we i want to say we we was in the weight room so hard bro i can't even tell you bro it was it was like uh i jumped from 185 on bench to 275 not even realizing what i was actually doing mm -hmm. um but it was it was insane i definitely put on some muscle and then you know talk about that just one further we'll just go ahead and skip to you know senior season as well but now you go from 225 to 232 then from 232, what was your final playing weight? The reason why I asked that question the way I do is because it's all about a process. See, so many players are like, oh, I got to get bigger now. Well, I'm like, do you really understand what it takes to put 10 pounds of muscle onto your body the right way? You know, yeah, anybody can, you know, just put on weight. That, that's not all good weight. If you're fat or out of shape, you're still going to get exposed. You have to make sure you put it on and take the time to do it the right way. Uh, so I will say senior year, um, I definitely put on about roughly mm, six pounds no. my senior year. So I went from like 232 to like 238. Mm. Um, I hit 240, but during the season, you know, that weight fluctuated to go yeah. up and down. So like 238, I was, I was averaging throughout the, the playing week, but I will say I was, I was pretty solid 238, bro. Yeah. Six foot 238. Yes. What I was, my, my, man, it was crazy. I was 240 when our sophomore season was over. By the time we got to senior year and finished, I was 255. I got up to 260 and I felt heavy. I was like, I'm strong, but I can't yeah. move really. So I was like, okay, just chop it down a little bit more. So yeah, 255 was my playing weight. And I mean, a solid, healthy, mobile 255. I mean, Exactly. You know, but I think that's really important. Just understanding, like, it's not about you. You're not going to put on 10 or 15 pounds of muscle overnight. It's just months on top of months of training and eating right and discipline. But, um, Thanks. you know, so after junior year, you've been you become all state defensive ends. Talk about what that did for your confidence, knowing that your work was finally bearing fruit and you're getting the accolades and awards for it. What did that do for you? Uh, it definitely blew my head up a little bit, a little bit too much, actually. I went into the season <laughs> with so much confidence, but I think it helped. I think it paid off because I really was walking around like, oh, yeah, like I'm that guy. Mm -hmm. Now, let's see if I can do it again. You right. know, let's see if I can, you know, go above and beyond because I, I got honorable mention. Mm -hmm. You know, all state honorable mention. It wasn't really the, you know, the all state. Right, right. Feel, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, you know, a little bit. It was like, hey, okay, I see what y'all doing. Y'all yeah. trying to say I'm good, but y'all trying to say I'm not that good. You know? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that that chip on my shoulder was still there, definitely. No, and you know, let, let's let's go into just like you said, your personality. One of the things I loved playing with, I loved about playing with you was, you know just your confidence and your kind of laxness that you brought to the team. You know, you were a guy who had fun training and playing the game. Where did that come from, your joy? Oh, man. Honestly, I'll say that's that comes from my, like, my family. Yeah. Um, my dad and mom just before games, um, like – my dad was always my like head coach when it came to like baseball and other sports like that. So having him as a head coach, we would drive to the games and try to like, you know, joke around a lot and, you know, not really try to get too serious about the game. Cause at the, at the same time, it's still a game, mm -hmm. but he, he knew that I knew how to turn it on whenever it came game time. I was a very competitive guy. Like, dude, competition just made me, oh, man, just just made me so happy I got to go out there and compete. <laughs> but he would try to keep me calm because if I was anxious, mm -hmm. oh, man, I was I could throw a game, you know, just being too overexcited or, you know, burn myself out before the game. So he really tried to bring that, like, that humor out of me. Right. Mom, same as well, so. Uh, so I get that from you, you know, and it, and it goes to show that you can have fun playing the game. The game is supposed to be fun, yeah, but definitely. there's still one that has to 
go into it. And I think you were a good balance of what that looked like. You know, a guy who knew how to have fun but knew how to work. That was, I think, a big thing about our team was we were going to goof off and we were going to, you know, do what we're going to do. But in the end, when it came game time, it was like, hey, it's time to lock in. You know, we had a really good ability to flip, flip that switch. Um, so – after senior season, you know, you, you do well and uh, you get some offers. Now, the three schools I think you told me that you had it narrowed down to was uh, Sam Houston State, Nichols State, and Stephen F. Austin. Was that correct? Absolutely correct. And yes, so, sir. you know, one thing I like to kind of ask, and I think it's very interesting, is people's uh, process in picking a school. So just to uh, talk about what went into your final decision and picking the school that you did to go play in college. Um, I'll say what went into that was like, man, wanting to win. Yeah. Man, I'm I'm a winner. We <laughs> we went all the way to the third round of the playoffs and then we lost, you know. It wasn't a hard decision. You know, I go visit, you know, two of the schools. I go visit Nichols first. Mm -hmm. I look at the record. I look at the weight program. I look at what guys' maxes are, mm -hmm. you know, what they're running, you know, what they're putting out, how many mm -hmm. players they're putting in the league, stuff like that. Then I go over to SFA and I see, you know, it goes up a little bit, um, you know, better facilities, a really good weight room, weight program. Um, and then I go over to Sam, man. It's just they're coming off of a, a national championship appearance. They're mm -hmm. playing teams like North Dakota State, you know, known for their, you know, uh, ISO type of running mm -hmm. style, play style, and I see some heavy hitters. I walk on campus and I'm I'm looking at some of the football players and I'm like, dude, <laughs> these guys are big. They are huge. <laughs> Man, look, I talked to one of the uh, the strength and conditioning coaches there. The dude's jacked. Mm. He's he's humongous, and he's just like he's just looking at me, sizing me up and down. And he's like, oh yeah, we're gonna get you right. We're gonna get you right so i'm like all right this school they they coming off of wins they're known for winning Let, let's go here Man. easy decision very good and then see it's very interesting you know because not every player you know unfortunately winning is not everything to some certain people you know some people yeah. it's proximity to home some people it's location some people it's getting away from home playing time whatever the case may be and so it's very interesting i love just hearing you know the way people kind of make the decisions and their thought process um but okay, so now you, you get to Sam Houston State. Just talk about what your college football experience, you know, was like because we never got to have this conversation. Facts. Um, so I got I got to Sam Houston. Um, I was blessed when I walked in there, man. Truly, um, a guy was actually hurt, mm. just like my you know sophomore season. Uh, a guy was hurt. Um, and I was a true freshman, so it was like, okay, this dude, Tori, he got good hands, man. He got good footwork. He decent size. Um, he put on 10 pounds before getting here. That was another thing, transitioning into college. That whole summer, bro, I wasn't doing the, you know, the crazy partying, the, you know, the traveling and stuff like that. I was trying to get ready for my season. Mm -hmm. And fortunately enough, they allowed me to come up earlier than – most of the freshmen mm -hmm. and started training right off the bat. So I put on 10 pounds. I got to 262. I went from like 242 to 262, almost 20 pounds, almost. Yeah, <laughs> it was crazy. I grew a little bit and then I, mean, I got bigger. Um, but yeah, they saw that and dude, I legit got my opportunity as a true freshman, got to play. And uh, man, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, got kind of knocked down. If you want me to go a little further into it, absolutely. Um, you know, let's go into um, it. Pretty much, I thought going in, I was gonna be that guy. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna be a true freshman. And I'm gonna start. I'm gonna play. I can go in here. I can play in front of all these guys. You know, my confidence high. I always had high confidence. I was always confident in myself. And then, you know, just kind of, you know, I, it was a reality check. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, you're not that guy. You're not that strong. You're not that fast. You know, we need you as a backup to do this role right here. We got guys who are going to play this many snaps. You need to be able to play this many snaps and you need to be successful at it. So like the roles change. It went from like making plays to like, hey, we need you in here when this guy's tired, but you don't need to suck. <laughs> you need to go hard and also 
play your position, you know? So, right. So, so, it was a huge change. so you're going through this and just talk about what, what, like, how are you dealing with it? Like mentally, you know, because again, you're coming in, you're, you're having a lot of success. You're the guy and you're a freshman, you're young. And for certain people, they don't really know how to handle it. Like, it's like, wait a minute, you're telling me that I'm not getting the playing time that I used to get. I'm not getting the adoration from either my teammates or the coach that I'm get that I used to get. So talk about what, how you were able to handle that uh, adversity. Um, a lot, a lot of that, I would say I owe that to my coach, my position coach who I had. He just saw so much talent in me that the dude just would always stay on me. You know how like some some coaches say like, you know, when your coach stopped talking to you, mm -hmm. that's when you should be scared. Yeah. So he would always he would always be checking me, you know, like he'd be like, hey, what you doing this play? Mm. Like we'll just be sitting in the back of the line watching the, the starters play. He'd be like, what you do right here? Or like, what you do right here? You ready for this? Yeah. Oh, okay. What this dude look like? What's his, uh, you know, what's his weight? What's his height? Bro, for the first time in my life, I was actually tested mm -hmm. as a football player, you know, mentally. Mm -hmm. He was getting me mental reps on the sideline. So that was a big, like, help for the transition, bro. Like, he was just – the mental reps really got me right. That's good, That's good, man. And it's good to hear that at least you had a coach who believed in you, you know, because yeah. so many athletes, I think, um, they get put in a bad situation. It may look good, you know, on face value when they first get there and then – you know, who knows, a coach gets fired and then all of a sudden it's a new staff who didn't recruit them. Oof. And, you know, now they're dealing with a coach that really doesn't believe in them or, you know, they get in, they face the adversity and don't know how to handle it. And then they flop or they burn out or they quit, you know. And I, I think it's really good to, you know, hear, you know, how you had a coach and how you, were, you weren't going to let it, you know, deter you or demean you or, you know, let you quit. You know, you just said, OK. There's a little bump in the road. Let me just handle it, you know. Um, so just going to the rest of your uh, your playing days, at least at Sam Houston, you know, what was it like uh, as far as on campus? You know, what was it like being a student at SFA? Or was it great? Or Sam Houston, nice. Sam Houston. Nah, yeah. nah, sorry. Um, <laughs> man, being a student at Sam, oh, man, it was a great life. You're an hour and 30 minutes away from Houston. So you're not far from your boys. You can go yeah. back and see them at any time. I had my best friend 45 minutes in the other direction at AM. Mm. So I was real comfortable. Like, dude, I made, you know me, I'm, I make friends easily. I'm that guy. But that also, you know, I will say, I'm going to be honest, it came with a little trouble. Just, I was, I was playing as a true freshman mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, confident in myself, you know, to, you know, go around, meet new friends, talk to people and, and just be real social on campus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started getting invited to a lot of things that some freshmen don't see, you know what I mean? Get, <laughs> like getting what? involved in this. <laughs> like what? I, I got it here. Like, oh what? man, like I would, I would go to some of these frat parties and, oh man, it it was different. It was it was truly a different kind of party than what I was used to in high school, I can say. What? And, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> funny story, as a freshman, mm -hmm. they actually gave me, since I was so well known on campus, they actually gave me a recruit mm. for my freshman year. That, like, never happens. <laughs> like, <laughs> so my freshman offseason, they gave me a recruit because I knew so many people. So it was my job to convince this guy to come to Sam. And I was only a freshman. Yeah. So that is just kind of let you know how my freshman year went. It was it went well. It went well. <laughs> hey, see how beloved Torian is, y'all, bro. Like, you have to understand, this is a freshman who really isn't supposed to have any clout. And they're already assigning him recruits to go out and recruit others. Like, you generally give that to a junior, maybe even a senior yeah. who's been through the program and knows it. And they said, no. Nope. A freshman go <laughs> recruit this damn freshman. It was a lot of trust. It was a lot of trust there that I that I had with the coaches. And funny enough, Remus uh, Remus Bulmer, he was my roommate. So we oh, both played this true freshman. I know, I know. Funny, we we we're both playing this true freshman. We're the stuff. Our dorm rooms popping. You know, it's always <laughs> popping up in there. So yeah. Oh man, great great times. What was that like having our guy Remus as your roommate? That's what I want to know. <laughs> 
for the for the people who don't know Remus, Remus is a true character. For sure. He <laughs> he he is a blessing to ha- he was a blessing to have as a, a roommate, man. First off, he's he's gonna always have you there on time. You know, mm-hmm. if you if you ever sleeping in, he gonna wake you up whether he's playing music out his beats backpack or or he just, you know, he ready to go and he noticed that you're not up. He going to exactly. always make sure you're there on time. He going to joke with you. He going to test you. If you're having a bad day, he going he gonna to pick you up, bro. Great, great roommate to have. No complaints. Clean dude. Mm-hmm. Come on now. Yeah, can't ask for anything better than that. I mean, again, we played with Remus in high school, y'all, and uh, yeah. he definitely ultimate leader. Walked with confidence, much like Torian. So it's crazy that you put them two together in the same dorm. I mean, yeah, two real good leaders, two high character guys, two funny guys for sure. So I already know <laughs> y'all, had, y'all had things popping, but but at the wow. same time, still work hard. I think that's a misconception, you know, is that just because a person has fun, I'm, I want to keep harping this home, doesn't mean that they don't work hard. There's a balance. Facts. You mean? Facts. But uh, just going to some more of your experience, you know, um, first off, let, let, so I always like to ask this question: What was your favorite? college football memory what it could be either in a game or outside of a game and then what was your worst you can you can do either or um favorite college memory would have to be getting uh getting the interception my freshman year i saw that that. i saw that 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 set me off right there you know that just brought a lot of attention to me so right there i got the interception for the rest of the game my coach is running me in and out of the game Mm -hmm. i got to play that was my opportunity i made a few tackles so the coach is like okay we could we could play this guy you know the next week after that we was going into playoffs so he's like man we could really rotate this guy we could really use this guy why not have a rotation of five then a rotation of you know four guys and then one maybe you know so it was a full rotation of five i was in there having a good time didn't do too bad actually really so then now go to the opposite end of the spectrum what was your toughest college football memory toughest college football memory Oh, man, if I'm being completely honest with you, was hanging the cleats up, oh, man, just uh, it was. If I'm going to be completely honest, it was, you know, putting away the cleats, um, not by choice. You know, it, well, it was somebody who, you know, told me, look, you're, you're done here. You're more than welcome to go anywhere else. Yeah. Wait, OK, I got to hear this story. Yeah, yeah. man. So, so what happened? Straight up, I know. I mean, so, you summarized it, but I want the full thing because I never heard you say that. Yeah. So, so my junior year, no, yeah, my junior year comes around. Uh, man, I'm playing. I'm in the rotation, having a good time as well. Uh, first game of the playoffs, I get hurt. Mm. Sec- second game of the playoff comes around, and when I say I got hurt, I was like on crutches. Mm. There was no. Uh, chance of me playing the next game for sure and if we made it like past that game I was a maybe like man I was like 50 percent I want to say like I hurt my ankle pretty bad high ankle sprain Mm. and uh following that man following that ankle sprain I just would say my mind was not in the right place um when it came to football I wasn't worried about football I was like you know what my team got this they gonna they gonna go on take care of the rest Oh, man, I just I feel like I got involved with just the wrong crowds and the wrong groups of people. And that definitely was on my part because I was putting myself in those situations. Mm. And I kind of just I violated one of the team's codes pretty much. And our head coach, he kind of just threw his hands up and was just like, you know, th- this is on you. Like, what do you want to do? Mm. You, you obviously don't want to be here, you know he was basically putting all those, you know, negatives in front of me. He would just say, cause like, I've, I'm done here. You know, are, do you want to go somewhere else or do you want to finish out school? You know, you're going to have to sit out a couple of games next year. Um, what do you want to do? And, and it was kind of like, I feel like I made, you know, a pretty good decision, mm-hmm. but at the same time, I, I, uh, I definitely missed the game. Um, yeah. I missed out on a lot of stuff on my last year. As Sam, but it all worked out. 
Yeah, I feel you, man. You know, it, it, it's tough when the game is snatched from you rather than you, you hang it up on your own terms. I think, you know, I remember when I when I realized I wasn't playing anymore, it was the idea of um, – it was after, I mean, this was in back in high school. So I was getting recruited yeah. and basically he gets presented to me. It's like, look, I'm going to have any support, you know, you're not getting a full ride. So this is your decision. And I just had to yeah. look at it and say, well, I don't want to have to pay to play football anymore. I love the game, but I do I love it that much? I was able to play and not really have any lasting injuries. And so, um, yeah, I had to kind of give the game up, you know, when I didn't have to, I still had a competitor left in me. And so then, you know, after that, I was like, okay, well, you can't sit here and, you know, just be angry at the world or be angry at whatever the, however the situation unfolded. So I was like, okay, I still got love for the game. Let me just teach the next generation. That's how I keep my cool. connection to it. And so that's why, you know, part of this podcast is to inform the next generation. That's a motto I always have at the end of every show. Pass it down, pass the nugget down. You know, when young people ask me, oh, what'd you do here? What'd you do there? It's like, okay, well, I did X, Y, and Z. You know, I did this and I did that. And a lot of it too is also, I felt like I learned a lot of lessons too late, which is why I love hearing like you tell your story about how, hey, I got caught up with the wrong crowd and it cost me, you know, stuff like that. You know, it's to let people know, like, look, if you, you know, it's, it's the littlest mistakes that can cost you everything, you know, and then you can't take them back, you know, and smallest, the smallest, but, but it's good that say. people go through them. So that way, first off, they learn and then they can kind of tell people, Hey, look, I made this mistake. Don't make the same mistake I made or don't follow the path I did because this is where it got me, you know, and it's good for you because at least as far as you saying it worked out. Right. Because some people yeah. never forgive themselves, never forgive the past. And then they end up letting them, you know, it just bothers them and it s sticks there and it's always, you know, on their heart. So it's good that you've been able to, you know, overcome that and move on. But talk about what that was like, your ability to be able to move on. What was it that kind of let you have peace from that? Situation? Yeah. Um, it definitely wasn't easy. I'll say the first uh, six months I struggled with just blaming it you know on myself which it was on me and I pretty much sat there a whole semester uh, I can't say a whole semester I'll say the first three months of the semester and just was like dude you're you messed up bad dad and this is the end of your life mm -hmm. you know like this is this is the end of it this is where you hear about those players who just fell off the world completely and you know they just never recover from it mm -hmm. and then I'll say having, you know, a strong core of of a friend group, I was able to definitely turn that around. I just started surrounding myself with those friends who had that that successful mindset and was going places, you know, outside of football. You know, you got to have those people, too. Um, so I was like, you know, what are they doing? Like, what are they up to? So I started hitting my buddies up outside of football who were just going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And they was just like, bro. You, you don't know what it's like to not be a football player. When have you ever <laughs> known what it, it felt like to not be an athlete? So they opened my eyes. They was like, bro, you could do this. Mm -hmm. You could go do this. You can go. You can go look. You can go put your money here. You can go work now. You can go get a job. You know what I'm saying? You can go make some money. So I was like, all right, bet. Like, like well, let's do it. And I'll, I'll say that just helped my confidence, man. Like just having that core of uh, friends, that definitely helped. No, I think what you're speaking to is that especially when you get to a level where the game, whatever sport you play, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, whenever you're trying to get truly great at it and when you build a dependence or a devotion to it, that's all you know. I mean, you yeah. eat, you sleep, you live, whatever game you play. And then whenever it's all of a sudden just gone, there's this huge void that is just missing. It's like okay, what the hell do I do now, right? <laughs> and for some people, they, really? they don't figure that out. I mean, when I when I stopped playing, it was like, bro, what the, like, okay, I'm working part-time, but it's like, what, what else is there? You know, and then it was like, it, like you said, it took me de developing a friend group who were able to get me out of my comfort zone and like, bro, look, you know, have you ever thought about doing this? Have you ever thought about doing this? Have you ever thought about, you know, teaching this? Have you ever thought about that? And the next thing you know, it's like, 
damn, this world is pretty stupid. There's a whole lot of there's a whole lot yeah. of stuff I could get into, right? Like the world is bigger than football or basketball, whatever that case is. It's not a loser mentality, but it's just understanding that life goes on and you have to move on as well. And uh, you know, I think that's something many, many, many athletes really struggle with is what happens whenever they're done playing whatever game they are. Or let's say they're in between, you know, careers or jobs. Okay, what do I do now? I can sit here and sulk and I can blame the world or I yeah. can move on and I can, you know, nut up or, you know, just pick myself up and keep on moving. And I think that's the lesson that anybody can learn. So I want to get into this. I know that you were doing YouTube for a time and uh, your, your videos were actually really entertaining. And then all of a sudden you stopped. So just talk. Why did you stop? What happened? Um, Pretty much um, I was going into like my junior year in that off season. That's when I was really recording a lot. Um, I kind of got hit with the kind of an ultimatum from my coaches. They were just like, you know, hey, look, you should – um, really consider, you know, focusing more on football rather than, you know, shooting videos with your friends. And I was like, okay, these guys must be joking. Like, this is a, this is a joke. This isn't real. Yada, yada. So then I was elected as a captain or like a, on a leadership board. Yeah. Like, so that's when you run for captain. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so they expected a lot out of me from the next year and I got pulled to the side by one of the, uh, the coaches, the linebacker coaches who's going to be a D line coach that next year. He actually, um, he was like, Hey, look, I'm be honest with you. You're going to need to decide whether you want to play football or you want to really be a, a YouTube star and jokester all your life. And I was just like, I, the, the, the football in me was just like, bro, you going to throw this all away to, you know, go do some funny stuff that you could just not be willing to do in years and stuff like that. And then the other side of me was just like, bro, I really enjoy doing this. You know, I'm not making no money or crazy, you know, nothing, no advertisement sponsorships off of it. But I really enjoy, you know, making people happy, making people smile. And, and you know, I, I get a laugh out of it, you know, shooting it and putting it together. So I, that's really all I, I like doing. And uh, they was just like, hey, look, if you don't stop the, you know, YouTube, you know, we're going to have to kick you off. And, you know, that was just that was just one of the little things that almost got me booted, you know, from the team. But my whole, it all thing, worked out. my whole thing though is like, if it's something you enjoy doing, it's not causing you to do anything illegal. Like, I don't understand why they give you this ultimatum of saying, do something you love or you're off of our team. I mean, I get, you know, rules but it's not doing anything that's harming the team you know so it's crazy because i remember i had like you know like i mentioned uh i had cam on the show and he talked about a guy who had a youtube channel and basically his was monetized he was making passive income and yeah. we're talking about college athletes here who you know don't get to work and so he has something on the side that he gets money from a different organization. It's not even the NCAA. It's not like some boosters sending him money. And now they're saying you can't do it. If you don't stop doing your YouTube, then we're going to kick you off the team. And so it's kind of the same thing of making people like suppress or stop their hobbies. Like, again, like you said, it brings you joy because it's bringing joy out of others. You know, you should promote that. You should want your players to. Facts you know, have interests and have other things that help them kind of get away from the football thing and get away from the stress. So that, that, that's crazy that that yeah. happened, man. To better explain it, they tried to throw like, um, they tried to scare me. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm really being honest, they tried to scare me and be like, hey, like, look, the NCAA doesn't allow you guys to, you know, uh, shoot YouTube videos. And I was like, <laughs> wait, where does it say that at? <laughs> and right around the time that, um, you know, this was going on. I just had seen a YouTube video by this guy. I think his name was destroying a real famous football, uh, YouTuber at central Florida, uh, university of central Florida or South Florida, wherever he goes, mm -hmm. but he was dealing with the same thing. It was around the same time. It was crazy, but he was making like million, I guess thousands of dollars off of his videos and they gave him an ultimatum. They was just like, Hey, look, 
if you don't stop your YouTube videos, you're going to get booted off the team. He chose the YouTube route. Unfortunately, I wasn't making big bucks like that to just be like, hey, I'm going to do this. But, yeah, all in all, you know, it is what it is, man. Um, I would still love to come back to it. Uh, sure, man. I'm just was entertaining, bro. I was <laughs> 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 definitely got to laugh. But, but you know, on all, in all seriousness, though, that's that's what I'm talking about in terms of this whole, you know, first off, just being a college athlete and in terms of the grind, it's not all fun and games. It's not this mm-hmm. high life, you know. You're not getting the special treatment like it's being portrayed like on these football shows where it's just, oh, all they're doing is partying. It's nothing like that at all. You know, the mm-hmm. real life of a college athlete. That's why I love hearing you guys' stories of like what the sober and the reality of it is. And yeah. on top of that, this whole idea of athlete competition. Okay, if it's a matter of we don't believe in athletes in college getting a salary or receiving compensation from our school fine i get that and that's no problem you know that's your rules but then to say not only are you not allowed to get money from our institution but you're not allowed to make your own money period is where i'm like come on man I'm like <laughs> if you really want me to break down the, like the some of the numbers like i want to say half the school's revenue almost is coming from athletics, right? A huge portion of the school's revenue is coming from athletics. And a lot of that's coming from football. They know football is a hot sport, a hot topic. Um, It produces a lot of revenue and it it gets players, you know, paid lots of money, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's more positions to make it to the league, you know, from college football. Mm -hmm. Um, I just know that, the amount of money the boosters would donate, there's no way that <laughs> that wouldn't be able to help out, you know, some of the players who were really struggling, who who really needed it. So that's what I'm saying. And not every and, and the whole thing is that not every player gets to play in the NFL. Right. So no. this whole idea of, well, you have to earn your way to like that. Do you understand how low those odds are? So basically you're saying. You know, if you don't make that NFL up, well, tough luck. You know, I mean, that, that's insane to me. And again, counting people's pockets like that, uh, counting people's money, that's where the real issue I have and the real irritation I have with it. Because it's like, it's not just for me, but it's like, you know, me who has younger, like younger, you know, cousins, nephews, you know, and possibly children who might get into college football. I don't want them going into a, in a, into a system and into an institution where it's like, Sorry, we're just going to pay you this scholarship, but you can't yeah. make more money. You can't learn. It had been better off if you had said, look, we're going to take this scholarship money and we're going to make you take courses as part of your scholarship where you understand financial literacy and understand how to make money with this opportunity that you're given. I'd rather you use it in a productive manner than saying, oh, well, we don't think you guys would be financially responsible. So therefore, we're not going to give you that chance to prove yourself. Like, you know what I'm Man. saying? If only the world thought like you. If only the system thought like you did, bro. It, we would be different people today. I would be a different person if I knew how to manage my money um, better. If I knew how to, um, you know, understand the budget, understand stocks. Um, like coming out of college doing that, that's a different ball game. You know, some people don't learn that until, you know, years down the line. You coming out of college, learning budgeting and taxes, how to do your taxes and, mm-hmm. you know, you know, different different elements of the world, man, of life. Man, that would, we would just be so different. Well, I mean, it's just, but, we'd have better prepared adults and better prepared people. Like, and I think it's more indicative of a bigger problem, which is something I always talk about that, like, the idea of just education in general, you know, the American school system and this whole idea that, you know, people aren't bought into it. People don't think it really benefits them. And I'm like, you know, there's, there's always value in education in any way, shape and form. But the problem is that people don't think it's preparing them for real life after college. They yeah. just think it's something that is a piece of paper that they get that validates that they can work rather than them actually learning something, you know? And I think that's where the system can be changed or rebooted or revamped is try to prepare young adults to be independent and to be able to provide and think for themselves rather than having to learn lessons so late. And then now they're in debt or they, they are not aware of opportunities that they didn't know that they were privy to. But, you know, again, um, uneducated people are easy to manipulate and that's unfortunate. So, 
you know, it's just on people who do know or people who have a, a semblance of an idea to spread the awareness. And that's what uh, we try to do, man. So for sure. Man. No, so it's great. But um, no, now football is done. Present day, man, I know you talk about you just got a job working in IT. But what else you got going on? Uh, clearly, you have your friend group, Tyler and them. What else you got going on, man? Um, other than work, man, uh, like you said, you got to find people that, you know, try to get you to try new things. And uh, luckily, I've been blessed with, you know, a friend that showed me uh, so many new things that, you know, I've been able to select the things that I like and the things that I don't like. So lately, I've been really into fishing. Oh, wow. And yeah, I know. I know it, it, it's different. It don't really sound like me. But man, like, just being able to get out on the water, it relax. It actually relaxes me. Oh, for sure. And for sure. Yeah, like I didn't even know like how much people can you know really get away and escape from the real world. Mm. You know, by by doing these simple things that people do every day. Like, dude, like people fish for a living. Yeah. So, like, just being able to get away and get on the water and shoot try to you know get a little competitive on the water you know like he's catching fish well well shoot my fish is bigger you know or who who has the bigger fish you know i'm trying to catch this i'm trying to catch a bull red i'm trying to catch you know it's just uh different things to life that i found to enjoy and you know i'm i'm looking to find even more things man no nah, it's great and hey if, if fishing is what you love to do then so be it if it's a hobby i know a lot of people fish and you know that water you know for me um, it was, I got into powerlifting for a time because I was like, I still got this competitor that is just, yeah. sitting there. okay, well, compete in weightlifting and just do it that way. I got into that. I got into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for a time, you know, just because, like, okay, that's something different. That's a different uh, mind challenge. And then just in terms of, you know, you and I both have these personalities where we think a lot, you know, we have a lot going on. And so, yeah. We need things to kind of calm our minds down. And for me, it's like reading. I mean, as crazy as it is, it's like reading, you know, philosophy, meditation and things of that nature. I mean, being able to learn from different things and actually learn not because oh, you were told to read a book, but like actually figure out the way others thought and things of that nature. I mean, definitely, I think that's, you know, something that's key nowadays, being able to have a hobby and being able to find different interests that are diverse, you know? <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Come on now. But man, just uh, closing out, you know, this has been a great episode. Um, you know, always first off, the last uh, topic I want to get into is just the whole uh, college football and athlete compensation. So where do you fall on that uh, on that spectrum? What is your take on athletes being paid in college? Oh, man, I definitely think that we should, as athletes, be paid. I'm 100% behind it. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you a short example. Like, I know when I first got there my freshman year and they gave me that, that football check, mm. half of it went to my mom. You know what I mean? And then, like, the other half of the semester, I kind of was handicapped. I was struggling because I didn't have nothing to follow that. It was like they hand you a check for you know a decent size amount to get you through the semester mm -hmm. some some people got to give that to their family you know some people got to give they got kids man we had so many guys on the team with kids dude mm. these dudes can't work they can't work part-time jobs they got to play football they, they're starters they, they're trying to get to the league you know sam houston's division one double a like people mm. are still trying to go to the league you know we putting out people yeah. so Man, they definitely should be paid. That would help a lot. That would keep them off the streets and keep them from doing bad things that they don't need to be doing, you know, to stay afloat. So, man, for sure. Definitely should I be mean, paid. again, I, you know, I always bring that topic up because it's way bigger than just, oh, I just play football. I'm like, no, mental health, uh, you know, injuries, families. Like you said, these are grown men now. They're not children. So they don't got mom and dad really to watch over them like you do in high school. So, I mean, these guys are real adults and they have to figure life out on their own. And now you're telling them, well, not only can you not work, but I won't pay you a dime outside of really this scholarship that really just pays for your tuition and you don't get nothing else. So it, it's crazy, man. But just uh, last thing, man, wrapping up, what is your final gem to the next generation of athletes, young men, young ladies from your store that you would want to impart on them? Um, to the athletes, I'll say 
like I know this is cliche, but dude, when when adversity adversity hits, like truly when it hits you, and an obstacle is presented, like don't give up. Like truly on that dream, I'm I'm talking from the heart, like from experience. Don't give up on that dream or don't be so easy to give up on that dream just because you may think it's going to turn out a certain way. Be more optimistic, have a little more hope and a little bit more faith. That's all I'm going to say. For sure. And great words always. That's a wrap for Insight Podcast, episode 26. I want to thank my guy, Torian, for coming on, man. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me on, bro. I truly enjoy what you're doing, bro. Keep this up, bro. I love it. No doubt, man. I appreciate you. You can catch this episode on YouTube, Anchor, Spotify, and all platforms streaming podcasts. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.